we're live. Whoa, this is going to be super cool. Uh, really, really excited to be uh, live on YouTube and LinkedIn today. You might actually be watching the recording, so that's another option uh, too. But uh, yeah, today, uh, Wednesday, September the 13th, we're live uh, a bit early for some folks maybe in the US, but hopefully many of you are able to tune in for the first um, Zephyr Tech Talk. Uh, so every other week, maybe more often in the future, if there's uh, lots of um, uh, people that line up to actually join me uh, as guests, hint, hint, feel free to uh, to reach out if that's the case. Uh, but yeah, first episode today is going to be all about hardware in the loop testing uh, with Zephyr. So uh, this is going to be really, really interesting um, as a reminder, I mean, not a reminder because I'm telling you that for the first time, but uh, we want those sessions to be super interactive. So whether you're watching us on YouTube or on LinkedIn, uh, ask questions, any questions you may have, comments, uh, like just drop them in the chat and we will be um, we will be asking them to our guests uh, today. Speaking of which, our guest today is Mike, uh, Mike from Goliath. Uh, I will not risk saying your last name while I actually <laughs> did. So I, I looked it up earlier, uh, Mike Stich, right? Is that correct? Yeah. That's exactly oh, right. Awesome. Well so yeah, thanks uh, so much for joining us. You are our first guest. You uh, you volunteered to, uh, to to join us. You are a Zephyr ambassador. You are working at Goliath, I think. So uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself uh, before we dive right into the uh, the topic that you're bringing us today. Yeah, so I've uh, been working with embedded systems for a long time, uh, firmware for more than 15 years now, and joined up uh, with Goliath as a developer relations engineer at the beginning of 2021, and have been working just a ton on Zephyr and really grown to enjoy it um, over that time. And I was happy that you asked me. I think we talked about it at uh, the Zephyr Developers Summit a few months ago, and you said, hey, I think I'm doing these uh, these live streams and we want them to be technical. And I said, you know, the thing that we've been working on, which is pretty involved, but pretty impactful is hardware in the loop testing, um, which is the ability for you to incorporate in your, you know, continuous integration um, flow, the actual hardware, the microcontroller boards that, that you're writing code for. Um, and it's really been transformative for us at Goliath. We're uh, an IoT platform for connecting microcontroller level devices to the internet really easily and controlling those fleets. And uh, we try to support a huge range of hardware, which is why Zephyr is perfect. And the issue that we have there is when you support a huge range of hardware and you have multiple SDKs, the manual testing for that is like really arduous, um, but really important. And so the, I think what we're talking about today is um, going to be transformative to us in the long run and it has, been, has already been quite impactful. Awesome. So yeah, like, so like you said, we we were discussing uh, this new series that, that that's being launched today. And one thing that I asked you and uh, pretty much every other speaker, and I will uh, towards the end of, of today's presentation, I will um, share a bit more about like what's what's coming next. But a couple of things I asked you and the other uh, guests is it's going to be super technical. So don't bring slides, which which you did, but it's really just like uh, really, it's really, really going to be light on slides, right? And you have tons of yeah. tons of demos as well. So yeah, like, um, and something I, I, I said, I told you and, and, and many others is that I, it's actually uh, pretty selfish, those different tech talks. I do plan on learning a lot myself, right? So it's, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to learning from you on uh, all things um, hardware in the loop testing and like hooking up real hardware to, I think, GitHub, you will be uh, showing in your demo. So yeah, why don't you take it away? Like, uh, do, you, do you want me to, to bring your slides on screen? Maybe? Um, yeah, bring the slides up for just a minute. Okay. Um, I have one slide with um, some links on it. So if you want to follow along with the slides, it's here, but maybe more useful is the example repo. We're going to do three workflow examples. Um, but you did just mention like you want to learn stuff like I want to learn stuff too. So if you're watching this or either live or after the fact, and you're like, oh, they're doing it wrong, or you missed this thing, like, I really want to know about that. So you can you can email me, Mike, at uh, Goliath.io or our developer relations team is devrel um, at Goliath.io. Uh, we'll also uh you know show a link to these slides a little bit later i think i have some short links when i get to the actual workflows um i already said who i am there's some mastodon and blue sky here if you want to um, reach out that way uh and then um goliath itself like i said is uh, uh it's your instant iot cloud for microcontroller level devices and i'll just point out 
we have IoT in our name. So the, the spelling of the URL there is kind of highlighted. Um, but maybe we should just jump into um, a demo right away. So I've actually just taken the Blinky demo that is in Zephyr. It's like one of my go-tos when I'm standing something up. Um, and I made it so that it runs with a workflow. And so what's actually going to happen with this workflow is it's going to compile on the cloud. Uh, it's then going to get downloaded as an artifact. Uh, and it's going to flash and run on the board. So I have this NRF52840 that is currently not flashing. I think the LED is right here if I look at the camera. Um, and the other thing is it uses uh, GitHub Secrets. And we'll look at that in a second. So let's see. I need to switch, I think, to this window. This one. All right. Uh, so here is the the uh, repository I was sharing the link with, and uh, I'm just going to go into actions now. I have all these set up for manual execution, um, but you can of course set them up for you know on a pull request, which is what we do, or also on schedule. We run them every day, um, and I've just got one called Blinky. Here's my manual button right here, um, and I'll go ahead and start the workflow. And uh, let's see. Should start in just a moment. We can follow along. All right. So as we watch this workflow start, um, this first step is the build on the cloud step. And so this actually uses the um, container that Zephyr makes available for CI/CD, uh, and it's uh, pulling all of those things. The thing that I haven't done in here, and our CEO Jonathan Berry actually uh, gave me the code snippet for this, but I haven't cached. These um, you can you can use caching on your workflows so that it doesn't have to download and set these things up. Um, so we might see these set up for a moment or two. Um, while they're doing that, let's just take a look at the workflow file here. Um, so you can see this is my trigger right here. Workflow dispatch is what gave us that manual button to go ahead and click. Um, it starts a job. Here's the container right here that the Zephyr project makes available for you to use. Um, and then I go ahead and just check it out. There's a bunch of um, setup right here, but basically what this is doing is just like a user would do uh, with the, the Zephyr tree, it's pulling it in. Um, this is actually pulling in the Goliath uh, example that's being used in here uh, and then setting it up. And then we go, uh, these should look very familiar to anyone that's, that's used Zephyr before. So it's got the build command with the board. Um, and at the end of that, it uses this um, step here where it actually tars up the hex file and then it uses this upload artifact to upload it. That's kind of like the first part of the run. The second part is going to be what actually runs on um, my local uh, self-hosted runner, which is what we're going to look at in just a minute. Let's check in here and see. It should be just about ready. Hmm, I, don't, I don't know. That might take a while. Uh, Let's look at the second part of this. So if you look at this, um, it has this special runs on. This is kind of where the magic happens. So uh, self-hosted is a keyword for GitHub that says, instead of actually running this in the cloud on a GitHub controlled uh, instance, I'm gonna run this on a different computer specified by the owner of this repo. And that computer is actually this machine that I'm broadcasting from right now. Um, for our company's workflows uh, for Goliath, we've built out our own uh, self-hosted runners that are like a single board computer, a router, a wireless router, a uh, um, USB hub, and like four or five uh, different testing boards, depending on whose runner it's running on. And so this can be installed at whatever office you have just by plugging in uh, ethernet cable and uh, power, so like a power strip. Um, and that means that hardware can just like live there and run the tests. And um, some of the stuff that we've done means you, you never have to touch it again, which is, which is pretty sweet, and pretty nice. All right, so let's check, on, check in on this again. It looks like right now it is build, doing the build for Zephyr. And you never knew watching of a Zephyr build was gonna be so exciting, Benjamin. Yeah, well, I mean, what's exciting is that you're bringing live demos, so I love that. <laughs> All right, well, maybe so I that. actually have. A, 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 I'm sure you will be explaining more what uh, self-hosted runners are, but uh, uh, off the top of your head, like what what's the sort of the cost implications? Like, is this something that one can run for for free? Well, I mean, I guess you're bringing the machine, so there's that. But uh, is there, um, do you know, if it's available for everyone to use on on their own GitHub uh, orgs and and projects? 
You know what? It is available for everyone to use on their own GitHub orgs and projects. And I actually ran this on the wrong <laughs> project. Oh, so yeah. yeah. This, I remember I'm you told me that. Are you messing up your org. company's CI right now? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I am messing up my company's CI. So, no, I'm actually not because I don't have a runner on this one. So let, that's actually the next uh, step on my slide is let's actually look at a self-hosted runner. So what happened here, I meant to run this on my own org. Um, and what happened is when it got to it, it said, okay, uh, waiting for a runner to pick up this job because it has that self-hosted runner tag and there are no runners. So I'm going to go into settings on this repository and there is an entry called actions and an entry called runners. And you can see that there are no runners configured for this. So that's why we're not able to host it. So um, two things that I want to do, um, I'm actually going to have to uh, undo my current runner setup. So let's go ahead and do that. And so, so we had Judy Kyle in the chat was asking, um, how do you link the workflow and the machine you're working on? Yep. So that's basically what you're yep. showing. So right that's now. what we're working on right now. So you can see here's my personal runner, and uh, I'm going to take this and remove this runner. And what it does uh, is ask me to log in. Sorry, folks. This is the live demo challenge right here, Benjamin. <laughs> Come on. Sue authentication failed. Come on. GitHub. This is a problem. We have lots of people saying hi in the chat in the meantime. So this is really cool. We have people from Argentina, from Brazil. Uh, what else did I see? I think Italy was there as well. That's super cool. Hi, everyone. All right. Back on track here. Perfect. All right, so what I'm doing right now is deauthorizing this actions runner uh, because I already had this set up and now that runner has been removed from my personal uh, instance. I'm gonna go ahead, so again, I've gone into my repo and you can do this on any repo and you can do it on free accounts or, or um, company accounts, it works for everyone uh, because basically you're saving GitHub money. So you're saying instead of running on the cloud, let's run on my own hardware. Um, so I'm going to settings in my repo down to actions and to runner. And there's this green button that says new self-hosted runner. And it's gonna say, okay, this self-hosted runner, is it a, a Mac, a Linux or a Windows machine? So when we are using um, single board computers, I select you know ARM64, because those are usually ARM64. This machine that I'm on is, is an X64 device. And it gives you this whole block of downloading and installing the software. It's all pretty basic, like installing that's a pretty simple process, but the key part is this configuration right here. So it gives you this um, token that's only available for like an hour. And hopefully no one is savvy enough to steal my token before I get it in here. Um, and so if I get the weird formatting out of here. All right, so what I'm doing now is in, with that self-hosted runner, I'm gonna give it that token and it's gonna go and authenticate with GitHub. Um, it says, do I want to add it to a runner group? And in this case, I don't have a group set up, so I'm going to use the defaults. The name of this computer is Krusty, and I think that's fine for this runner. And then here's kind of an important step, and you can you can fix this later, but if you look at this, this has that self-hosted label on it, which it really needs, and it says anything else that you want to add, you can add as well. I'm going to add NRF, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to add has NRF, uh, 52840. Um, and apologies if you mentioned it, but your crusty machine, like is this your actual, like the actual computer that you're uh, using right now? Or is this like a Raspberry Pi you have attached no, to your machine? My, yeah, this is my actual computer, just okay. because it's easier than for the live demo, me SSHing into something else. Okay, perfect. Um, and you can name that whatever you want. So like we name our others like Mike's Orange Pie if it's running at Mike's house or, or that sort of thing. Um, this next question is like the, the folder that you want all of the workflows to run in. And so I'm going to select that. And then we've actually done all the setup. 
Um, we're not running yet. And so you can see there are some helper files in here. And so one of them is run.sh. And if I run that, now it's going to say, all right, connected to GitHub and listening for jobs. And now if I go back to this uh, settings, actions, runners area and reload it, now we can see that there's a, a runner right here. So that action that didn't, uh, that's waiting before, it's for some reason, if if it's currently waiting, it doesn't pick up that um, that runner, but I can cancel that workflow and then rerun rerun it. So that's just like it had been running before. So the previous step compiled in the cloud, that's already done. We're not gonna do that again. And then we're gonna go to the next step, which is to run on a self-hosted runner. Uh, did I get the name of the tag right has oh i need a dk let's try that again all right so what happened is when i added that tag that's important for the workflow and um, i got the tag wrong so if we look here i have has nrf 52840 that should have had a dk on the end of it all right so i can edit this runner and i can add a tag And, and tags would really be the sort of the only way to go to route a, a particular uh, job to a particular runner or? Yeah, that's right. This self-hosted tag is the one that says, okay, run it on a self-hosted runner. So that's on yeah. one of these. And then you things. add to it more semantics by adding. Yeah. Yeah. So in this yeah. case, the other tag that I have in this workflow is make sure that you actually have this device. Because in our company, we have some uh, runners that have one device, some runners that have another device. And so you need to make sure that the runner is actually getting the um, tags that you want. All right. So yeah. if we go back and try one more time. Getting to Blinky's never been so easy, Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now it is starting the job, about to run on our self-hosted runner, which is Krusty. That's a repository level runner. Oh man, this is just going to be bad news all the way through. Uh, so the other thing that I don't have set up here is um, our secret. And so uh, in secrets and variables, you can pass secrets and variables. Um, and you can show this, Benjamin, it's fine. This, okay, is, okay. Not a, uh, this is not a secret secret. Um, but I have this key here set up. So this key is the serial number for the board. Um, and I want to go back in to settings and secrets and variables. Um, I chose this because it's not a very uh, secret secret. But if you... Yeah, it's um, more an, an, an environment variable, right? Yeah, exactly. So if I... Um, let's see. If I go NRF, JProg, um, and then it's... Let's see, it's dash I, I think. All right, so there is the serial number for this board. And, uh, you know, you don't have to pass um, the serial number like this, but I, like I said, I thought it was an interesting um, example of what you could do. Failed to pass secret, new repository secret. Let's see. That seems fine. Did I get a problem with the paste? Man, what's well, going you didn't on? save it. Like just, just you hmm. got it. Hmm. Wow, interesting. It's really strange. Uh, let's see. Light I documented knows. it. Let's see if the document actually works here. Um, yeah, it should be that. Uh, secrets, variables. I think it should be secrets. I might need to go back to the other runner. But 
there it goes. Huh. That was weird. Whoa. So what was, we don't even know what was the issue, or do we? I don't know what the issue was, but now that's saved. And uh, all right, fifth time's a charm. This is definitely going to work this time. Well, we, I mean, we're still just like 15 minutes into the demo <laughs> and you started pretty much from scratch. So there's that. Like it's yeah, I guess this is like no no previous setup because I had planned to use I planned to use my a fork on my personal repo because we are running you know our CI CD tests on our org repo and I yep. kind of wanted to stay away from that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now you can see it's actually this step right here is actually the computer uh, flashing the board and now we have a flashing LED right here. Woo! That was fast, nice. All right, so the song and and the job is run. successful. Yeah, exactly. Yep, it ran successfully. And you can tell because the board is flashing, um, which is good. Um, now, it's a lot. This I, this is actually kind of how it works, at least for me, in setting up these workflows is you get a lot of failures and you work through all those problems and then they just run. And the thing is, this will now run well, except when you actually have a build problem because you checked in bad code or you know some other connectivity thing. And I should mention, um, I think it's harder to do these workflows that have real hardware working. Like for instance, um, this board uses a ESP32 as a Wi-Fi modem. And I've had a failure case with just this unit where occasionally it seems like the Wi-Fi modem gets stuck and it won't get uh, DNS lookups anymore until I power cycle it. So you will find some odd edge cases, which I, can, I guess it's kind of like the point of doing this testing. Like you'd never find that edge case if you were only testing online. Um, the last thing I'd like to mention is like this workflow is not doing any testing. So I really just flash and make sure that you were able to flash and run um, the program. And you can see I'm doing the commands that you might use uh, from the command line in order to do that flashing. Um, but we haven't done any testing here. I think that's uh, what we're going to do in the next demo. So how would that work? Because um, you mentioned that sometimes to do the real f sort of full test, you might need to actually power cycle the board. Like, how would you go about doing that? Like, you know, you would need some extra hardware to maybe like switch the thing on and off as part of the the job or? Um, yeah, I mean, you, I, I haven't actually had to, had to do that yet. It's just something I noticed when um, working on this example. And like I said, it's only this piece of hardware. So it could be, I've actually soldered like wires um, to connect the two boards together. So it could be like my solder job. It could be something else. We have at least three of these other setups running with this board configuration that I haven't seen those uh, those power cycle issues with. So we haven't had to address that. Okay. But you can see here, like some of the things that I'm doing uh, for this board, I think, yeah, I have a recover command in this board. And that's for if you have a problem flashing uh, with a previous test, it can put the board into a, a, a state where it can't be flashed again. And so we just by default run the recover command at the beginning. And I think probably this erase all command is like redundant. So I'm probably erasing the whole board twice, but it's just one of those things where I want to make sure that when we actually get to the the program command, the board's not in a state where it's stuck. Right. All right, should we move on to the next example? Yeah, well, and it, it looks like, so Barrem has a question, which I guess is probably a segue into the next part of your demo, isn't it? Uh, hello, is it possible to add some code to the repo that would be able to parse logs coming from the device, uh, like the UART, and then decides if the execution slash the test is successful or not? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, the next example that I've set up for that is doing that exact same thing. And it is in um, the Zephyr samples hello world app. And Zephyr has a built-in test suite called, uh, or test runner called Twister. And all of these samples have Twister. I think all the samples that are built in the Zephyr tree already have Twister tests built yeah, that's, into them. Yes, that's correct. That's actually one of the requirements. Uh, we do want at a minimum the samples to compile just fine. So they are all uh, uh, sort of augmented with the, the metadata they need to, to be able to run through Twister, at least for compilation and potentially also to run actual tests like what you're going to show. 
Yeah, so I'm going to just, I just clicked uh, run workflow and we should see that pop up in just a minute. So this is actually going to lean on uh, the Twister workflow itself. And I think um, this should be rather quick. Um, so it's doing all the checking out stuff. Now it's actually running Twister. So here's the debug output you would normally see in Twister. It's found my serial device right here. So all that serial stuff that we just set up um, is running and it is doing the build test. Uh, the nice thing here is that uh, Twister handles the build. It handles flashing the device and it handles checking the output. And so if you can get it running, which can be a trick on these workflows, all of the actual hard work for testing will happen for you. And you can see that this is already run. And at the end of it, if I go back in, it has your Twister artifacts. And so um, it will ask me if I want to download. Uh, I'm not going to actually download that because I think we know what Twister logs look like. But if we look at the workflow on this one, um, so in this case, it is starting from the device immediately. So all of the um, all of the compilation happened on the self-hosted runner. None of this happened on the cloud. Remember in the previous step, we compiled on the cloud and then made a, uh, a tar bill um, and a compressed artifact and download it. This one actually builds on the self-hosted runner, so builds on this computer. Um, some things that I did have to have set up in advance are like I have the uh, the Zephyr SDK, like the set of compiler um, tools already installed. And so I need to tell it like where those are installed. Um, but you can see once it starts running, it does the checkout and it does the setup like it did before. Um, I need to make sure that I have the um, dependencies installed for pip. Uh, and then this is the actual Twister command. So um, it, I tell it like where Twister is in relative to the checked out uh, repository. Um, I tell it which test I want to run because I <laughs> certainly don't want to run all the tests, uh, which I think would be the default. Um, and then I tell it that I'm actually testing on the device. Uh, and then I give it a hardware map. So this is the, the other thing that you have to like set up in advance um, is a hardware map. And I have also documented that. So if I go, uh, let's go into this repository right here. Um, there is a hardware map that contains this kind of information. And this is actually, again, I don't think any of this information is secret. So I have the serial number for my device, which before you remember, I stored that serial number in a secret. Here, I had just have this board already on my self-hosted runner, this file. And so you could have a file for like each board you have set up on your self-hosted runner and just reference that. It tells you what device it is. So that's how Twister knows what um, to build for, um, how you're programming it and uh, the, the runner that you wanna use. And then uh, this is a neat one that I didn't know before. If you haven't tried this, um, on Linux, you can look in this dev serial by ID and you will get an endpoint for your USB devices that never changes, which is super cool. Um, and so I just give it that, uh, that file in the Twister command and uh, where that Twister command went um, and Twister does the rest of it. The final step here, and this is a nice little thing um, to have in your back pocket is uh, you want to uh, uh, compress the output of Twister, um, the Twister artifacts. And so I just take all of the logs from the Twister out directory that is created on the self-hosted runner and I upload them back to GitHub so that they're available. And that's what I was showing uh, before with the artifact you can download. Nice. And so the, the, the setup, like with installing West and um, uh, pointing to the SDK and things like that, is that also something that you could be doing using a Docker container like you were doing before? Yeah, um, we've actually done that. One of the things, um, one of the kind of advanced things that, that I want to talk about a little bit later is um, touchless self-hosted runners. So, uh, you know, we have these running at a bunch of different people's houses because we're a completely remote company. And those people shouldn't need to be experts in how these self-hosted runners work. And uh, so our, our goal is as we add new hardware to these, you should be able to plug in the hardware and that's it. The rest can be done from the cloud. So figuring out that, um, that hardware map that I just showed and the serial number and all that stuff, um, you can actually do that from workflows as well. Nice. Uh, in that case, so we'll, let's talk about Docker when we get to that um, after the last example. Sounds good. 
Uh, yeah, as a reminder, but I don't think I need to remind people, uh, please ask questions as they come. Uh, it looks like uh, on LinkedIn, at least, people are uh, people like Alexei uh, and uh, Jonathan on YouTube are taking care of answering each other's uh, questions. So that's really, really cool. Uh, if there are any questions that I missed for Mike, uh, please just uh, yeah, drop, drop them again in the chat and we will make sure that no questions remain unanswered. I was trying to highlight. So I think what I was highlighting on this one is the hardware map um, that we were doing. The last one um, is, oh yeah. Um, all right. So there are times where you're going to need um, specific input. So I think one of the goals with our um, workflows, the hardware and the loop testing is we don't want to change anything in the code that we're testing, right? So you don't want to, you know, make updates to the files um, that you've just committed in order to run the test. And so uh, this next one, we actually run um, on every PR and we run it uh, on schedule as well on our main SDK, which is a connection test. So we take um, the Goliath hello, which uh, compiles in Zephyr, flashes to the device, um, and then connects to Goliath and make sure that that connection is established. But you need to have um, things like this device is using Wi-Fi as the connectivity. So you need Wi-Fi credentials. Um, and then you also need uh, Goliath credentials in order to establish the encrypted connection to the Goliath server. And so I need to give those to the device. Um, and you can actually do that before the build by setting up environmental variables. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, you can use the GitHub secrets like I did before. Uh, and you can look in that first workflow to see how you make those secrets into environmental variables, or um, you can just store uh, them on the device itself. So on the self-hosted runner, I already have a uh, um, environment runner webinar demo .sh file that has these values in it, and it's just gonna make those available. So once I run that workflow, let's go back to our actions. Uh, the other thing I should mention is, uh, since these are building on the device, you do need to have the complete uh, Zephyr tree and all of the modules that you're using on the device. So the first time you run it, it will uh, kind of be like a, a long time uh, to get ready. So what I did is I ran it um, last night and it installed all of those onto the self-hosted runner. And then it just keeps those there and uses the West update command in order to, to uh, alter them. So we, we get a big speed boost there. Um, you'd mentioned running on Docker. Docker would do pretty much the same thing, uh, but by storing everything in an image that's like uh, revable and recreatable. All right, so we've already made it through that that step right now. Now we are doing the twister run. Hopefully, yeah, this will give us some output. All right, so um, there we go. It was waiting for the interface to come up. It got this is uh, you know starting the sample. Um, connecting to Wi-Fi, connected to Wi-Fi, uh, and then it passed the test right here. And we see here's the past example right there. And the uh, the runner's already done. So we've um, you know flashed the device, connected it to Goliath, made sure that the connection happened. Uh, and I think look in the workflow file, one of those commands in here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's a source. So that file that I was showing before that had the environment of variables, these runners are really just, um, you know, Linux boxes. And so uh, I did the Linux source command for this uh, file. That file had export uh, commands in it to set the environmental variables. So it sets everything up. And then I immediately run the twister in the same um, step as that. If you were to run this and then have another step, like later on, like if, if you needed them here, you'd need to run it again in the next step. Otherwise, there are some ways to um, to save those to what they call the, the GitHub environmental variables that they're available for the full run. Um, but for this one, it was simple enough to just pass those values one time. Makes sense. So there's, um, there's actually tons of questions lining up. Uh, I'm gonna put on screen a, a question from Brian, because uh, I think this one might be what you referred to as uh, touchless um, um, yeah. runners. Um, would there be a way for the runner to uh, automatically expose and declare whatever tags uh, it has available dynamically based on the actual 
hardware uh, boards that you're connecting it to? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's one that I ran across. So I was talking about that touchless provisioning. And in that case, there's a workflow that just goes and probes what hardware has been attached to a runner to make sure it's there and establishes what tags you need for that runner because it knows what boards you have. Um, I was not able to find a way to use the GitHub API to make those tags automatically. And so what I did is the output of that workflow tells the person running the workflow, go and add these tags to the runner. Um, I It's been a long time. It's been maybe two months since I did that work. So I, I can't remember exactly why I went that route, but, but my recollection is I couldn't find a way to do it. And so that was the one manual part of the, the operation. Okay. Um, and there was a, a question from Badi. Can you explain more of the unit testing part? Uh, maybe, I don't know if you have that somewhere in your tabs, but maybe uh, you could show, or I could pull it up, but uh, uh, maybe the, the actual test, uh, that's part of the Hello World um, um, sample in, in Zephyr, like the, 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 the bunch of YAML, which basically in the case of the Hello World, the actual test is about just checking that the um, hello world is effectively displayed on the console, right? So that's, uh, and if yeah. you can't find it, I we can go pull it up too. into yep. uh, samples, samples and then hello world. Exactly. I think it is the sample YAML file, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah. And so in this case, it tells you the harness is going to be the console output. Um, I think. I, do, you, are, do you have a good handle on this, Ben Benjamin? Do you want to? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm uh, just like reading through the YAML uh, in this particular case. Like we're instructing Twister to uh, to check that the uh, the console output looks like Hello World something, and typically a, a Hello World sample in Zephyr would be Hello World blank the name of the board. Uh, so that's what's going to be on the console, and checking that um, the Hello World works consistent. Checking that. Uh, uh, there is one and only one line on the console, which is Hello World. So that's, uh, uh, there's of course more advanced uh, um, mm -hmm. test cases that, that that may exist, but that's uh, sort of the gist of uh, the kind of things, sort of like the sanity check that you may want to do for your for your application. Yeah, so we actually use PyTest uh, for right. some of our sample. I, I haven't, I didn't plan to show this, but let's let's go and look and see. Um, so you can see here that there is a harness here that is PyTest before that said console. So it's just looking on the console. And in this case, we will then have a PyTest folder and the PyTest right. will have some configuration in it. Um, I would like to mention, this is the um, Goliath Zephyr SDK right here. And this is open source. So you can go and look at all this stuff that I'm showing right now, but it is, it's not in the same repo as the, the demos that I had for today. Um, this is all of the setup and then this is the, the testing itself. I am uh, a noob on PyTest, so uh, almost all of this. Yeah, it's, yeah I guess it's more like uh, you're sort of scripting the interaction with the um, the device and making sure that, I don't know, like if your device implements some kind of, I don't know, like 80 commands that you would check whether it behaves as it should um, based on the commands you sent or whatever. And uh, yeah, PyTest is one of the supported harnesses. I think uh, G-Test, Google Test is another one. And recently in 3.4, um, Robot Framework was also added, which is uh, even more um, of a script uh, approach because you have like this domain specific language where you just like have really simple instructions to um to check uh, to write to the the uart read uh, the output uh yeah check a bunch of things um as if you were just writing some kind of uh, the actual specification of your test basically it's not even writing code uh, at this point so that's uh, yeah and yeah, those and all, all, all would be built in. since everything goes through Twister. I guess all would be supported uh, with your uh, self-hosted runner approach, right? It's just a matter of running the Twister um, launcher, sort of. Yeah, and I think Z-Test is built into Zephyr. Is that right, Benjamin? Like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so uh, you can run the Z-Test on these devices. So you know uh, that's unit testing. And so if you were, you know, you had some peripheral, you had some um, like DMA operation, you wanted to make sure that the memory was showing up correctly on that or, you know, whatever other, um, you know, hardware specific peripheral you wanted to unit test, uh, this is a really good way to do it. 
Uh, before maybe we, we move on, we have a question from Thomas. Uh, any thoughts on what um, would be the approach? Should you have the actual debug slash flash probe connected to a different machine than the one running the runner? Uh, would they, what, yeah, what would be the approach there? Or do you have some some thoughts? Oh, that's interesting. So I think um, I think Sager has a uh, method of doing it. Let's see, blog. Uh, yeah, I guess if I, <laughs> I mean, the way I understand the question is, and it's certainly a legit question, uh, if you really have sort of a farm of devices, uh, you, you don't want to have one runner per device just because there's only uh, one device that you can attach to each physical machine. Uh, it, it might be, it would be nice to, to, to have more like a, a proxy, like Thomas is saying. Yeah, I haven't done it myself. You can check out this this blog post if you want. I don't know if I can just paste this into the chat, maybe. Um, sure, yeah. Connect your YouTube. I haven't connected my YouTube account, uh, which is the problem. Uh, so uh, at any rate, this is a remote Zephyr development using Sager Tunnel and RPC. Uh, this is a guest post from um, Vojislav Milovicek and Milovic, sorry. Uh, and this talks about um, a similar setup. So you can see there's a single board computer here connected to a uh, uh, NRF9160 board. And he was able to do remote um, programming and debugging this way. And I would bet that there's some way to do it here. Um, for us, it's really easy to set up the, the GitHub um, actions runner, which is what I was showing before with the uh, authenticating it with your repository. And so I would... I would pretty much always go that route. Um, the thing for me is just like getting these workflows right can be um, tricky. So just know that there's some, uh, you know, testing and, and uh, problem solving involved there. But once you get these commands working, they work really well. Um, the other thing is, um, I'm not sure how much of this, I can, how much of this is interesting, but um, I am in, let's go here. This is where uh, we're running the runner right now. Um, and I can actually go in to the work directory. So you can see, uh, if you remember back to when we authenticated, we just took the um, default name of work for things to happen in. And you can go in and see, here is my um, repository name here, this uh, Zephyr Twister HIL testing. For some reason, it does the name of the repository twice. Um, I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, maybe it's because I'm on, that's the, maybe that's the branch name. Uh, I'm on main. I'm not quite sure. Um, but then you can see like all the twist tests that I've run have actually lined up in here. Um, I don't think I have a solution for, um, clearing this out, but it would be a good idea to have these cleared out because eventually they will fill up. Uh, but you can see the, the tests that I've run here. Um, the app was the Goliath connection test. Um, that's in the repository. There's a blinky test and then uh there should have been the maybe there isn't a hello world test uh, but we did run the hello hello world so i would expect that there had been an output there but these twister out is where all your files are going so you can actually go in and see the build files um, for a run so i find this really um useful when uh kind of troubleshooting my workflows um let's see if i can figure that out here there is um, NRF, and then um, let's see. I don't know which one of these it's going to be. Yeah, so this is just like the build directory now. So like you can go in that you can see the build log is there. If you go into Zephyr, um, you can see uh, the actual uh, bin file, the L file. So if you have problems with a test, you can go back into your self-hosted runner and find these files. I don't think this is really an option um, when you're doing it on the cloud. And so it's kind of like an added benefit of having a, having control of the computer that's running the test. We have a question from Andrew or a comment slash question. Uh, one of the things me and my team are looking at in combination with Twister is two-way communication to the self-hosted runner to interact with external rigs. Have you encountered similar examples? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, 
we do two way communication between Goliath and the the self hosted runner when testing things like uh, we have uh, a database um, light DB we call a databasing system um, and the light DB state is a bi directional so the device can set things on the cloud and the cloud can set things on device uh, and so we do use pytest in order to um, set things while the test is running and. Uh, that makes it automated so you don't have to like be in a web interface like clicking. We're just going through our REST API. Um, but you can check out on, let's see, on the Goliath. Oh, man. Uh, in the Goliath samples, you can check out LightDB, I would say maybe set. And you can see how we've done that in PyTest um, for the different bi-directional things. I'm not sure that's the kind of communication you're talking about, but it is a place where I know that we're interacting with the test while it runs. Okay, well, yeah, I'll let uh, Andrew maybe add, uh, add some more. Um, uh, just again, there's one question that I almost missed, uh, which I had to, to think twice, but uh, I think it's actually interesting from, from Chinmei. Uh, isn't everything you showed just processor in the loop testing. I guess the way I understand it is that it's right, like you're, you started with say Blinky, uh, we didn't really check that the LED actually blinks, right? Or like the, the, the actual hardware behaved as it should have. Like do you have, I don't know, like do you have any thoughts on that or on like how you could like even it. more uh, test things even more physically and even closer to the actual hardware? Right. Yeah. Cause I was the one who verified that it was blinking, right? Like I looked yeah. at it and I saw and it was blinking. Yes. It's one um, second or maybe it's not, maybe it was 1.1 second that it blinked at. Yeah. That's interesting process in the loop. I mean, I think you're going to be able to draw that line like anywhere, sure. like at some point you have to say, okay, well, a build test doesn't run in the hardware. So you get a hardware problem. So now we've added the actual hardware. So now we're testing, not just the build, but the flash and that it actually like boots up and, and the output is as you as you expect it. So I would say that that is like vastly improved over what we had before. Um, for us, the majority of what we're working on on our SDK is not physically verifiable. Like if you think about IoT devices, most of them are like sensors somewhere that are sensing something returning data and a human is not supposed to interact with it. So uh, in our case, the the tests are things like, okay, we told the device to do something. Did it report that it got that in the right amount of time? And did it report that it completed that in the right amount of time? And those things are totally verifiable. Um, if you have something like, okay, a human's supposed to press a button and then that wakes up the device and connects it to the network and fires something off, I think you're gonna need uh, <laughs> like some external thing for that. Uh, since it is a self-hosted runner, you could have another piece of hardware that was connected through USB and you could run a command in the shell that like moved a motor to actually push the button. So I think it depends on how much uh, test rig, uh, like actual external hardware you want to build to like stand in for the human in the loop. Right, yeah. Uh, and there's kind of like anything in between, like Rodrigo is mentioning, there are also some solutions to simulate the hardware and to have like, um, yeah, a software implementation of whatever temperature sensor and humidity and whatnot. And uh, uh, it's still not going to be the real hardware, but uh, hopefully if you're confident that the, the emulator is um, is working as the, as close as possible to the real thing, then that's that's an option as well, I guess. Uh, doing a quick time yeah, and check. I, I think, I think yeah. that's a good point that like the, the testing needs to be holistic. So like you still need to have build testing on the cloud you still need to have unit testing on your actual code. I think that the hardware and the loop testing is to um, complement those, not to replace them. Yep, yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, so yeah, like a uh, quick time check, we are uh, nearing the end. So uh, to everyone watching us, uh, so you've been uh, super engaged so far, but uh, if there are still questions that you feel are um, at the back of your mind, uh, drop them in so that we can uh, address them, otherwise, we will have to just answer in the um, uh, in the comments in the recording of the YouTube video. Um, and yeah, Mike, like I don't know, like did you want to touch a bit about the? Uh, I don't know, like you, you said that you wanted to mention maybe the yeah. zero touch or the touchless uh, provisioning or like anything else. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I, I 
let's look and see if I have a slide on this. I can't remember what I had for um, the slide. And you, you actually did, did good. Like you almost didn't bring in or show in the <laughs> slide. So that, that that was pretty cool. Lots of yeah, I mean, cool my demos. slides are basically a thing that says demo. So yeah. I just, had, I yeah, just yeah. have a few of these. Uh, okay, one of the things that you and I talked about I wanted to mention is I'm completely showing GitHub because that's what our company uses, but there are um, self-hosted runner options for other platforms. I looked up the one for GitLab. Um, and they definitely have instructions there, so check that out. Um, I'm sure uh, if they're in, uh, if they're competing in this field, they probably have this option because it is so useful for things like we're showing off today. Yeah. And um, I think someone in, was mentioning uh, early on um, in in the chat that they that's what they've been using, uh, and so yeah, GitLab plus uh, okay. uh, Jenkins. I think I saw somewhere um, yeah. being mentioned. Yeah, yeah, Jenkins was an early one, and I think uh, kind of like paved paved the way for some of this testing. So it's nice to see that right. that, uh, the, that is continued on. Um, I did make this little diagram here just to kind of show what's going on with the self-hosted runner. And uh, the issue that we were having is um, if I, uh, one of the examples that I showed today was having a hardware map on the device. So our devices, the self-hosted runners are meant to not really be part of uh, like your home network or anything like that. They're supposed to be like encapsulated by themselves. Um, and just have a pipe up to the internet. And the issue that we were having is, okay, you'd have to get on a different network in order to SSH into this machine. You'd have to know how to navigate through the SSH and like make that hardware map file. And I don't think that that is like realistic, like that it's moving the work, right? Instead of doing the manual testing, now you're like manually managing your self-hosted runner. And so one of the things that we have worked on is making these runners touchless and uh, doing that a couple different ways. One of the things that I already talked about is that we have a, a private workflow that we run that will go and grab all of the serial numbers um, and USB ports and figure out what type of devices are on each runner. So you can run this and be like, okay, there's a board missing. Uh, that board must be bad. Let's send a new board to Mike and have him you know, swap it out with the USB. So all I have to do is just like plug the USB in that will run that again, see that the new board's there and add it to the workflow. Uh, but the other one is as the build environment changes over time, you really want to be on top of that. And so if I am kind of like downloading everything locally into the work folder, we may have problems with you know, files that are already there and you have to figure out like, how do I clean them out? And one of the ways that we're exploring right now, we haven't implemented it um, permanently yet is the ability to build uh, your, uh, to have your build environment be inside of a Docker container. And we found that uh, the Orange Pi 3 LTS is the board that we're using uh, because we haven't been able to buy uh, Raspberry Pi boards for a long time. Um, so we adopted that one and tested out. It works pretty well. Um, originally, we had started running on the four gigabytes of eMMC memory that comes on those, but that is not nearly enough to run Docker. Once we move to 128 gigabyte uh, SD card on those, then we can install Docker. It runs well. Uh, we made our own image, which um, uses the Zephyr uh, Docker image, but then builds in the rest of the build environment that Goliath needs. Uh, and then we know that each device is going to get the same build environment every time. And as we update it, we can just tell the workflow to use a new Docker container. OK. Um... A couple of questions. Uh, there's one that I actually see on LinkedIn. I'm not sure I should. I see it in, uh, in the actual um, stream you're thinking, but this one from Rene. Um, so I don't have the, the link and the pointer at, uh, at hand, but uh, the question is, um, there might actually be many, many test suites uh, that you want to run uh, against, uh, like whenever you make a change uh, to your repo. Um, is there a way with GitHub or with Twister, actually, to spread tests over many, multiple runners to bring down the overall time. Uh, that's basically how Zephyr itself does it. Whenever in the in the main Zephyr repo there is um, a change that being that's being contributed by any of the maintainers or, or contributors, uh, there's literally thousands of tests that might need to be run, and we run them in um, AWS, and it, they got like. The first step is basically figuring out the, the test plan for a particular change, and there's code that does just that. And that would sort of, uh, based on the number of runners uh, runners that are available, which is split the load across all of them. Um, so yeah, that's that, that's definitely an option. Uh, the um, 
yeah, I think that's for this one question. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, there was yeah, one we, from... We've actually yeah, seen that too, Benjamin. Like the, the One of the ways is to make your workflow files small. So don't do all of your tests on one workflow. And then GitHub will automatically um, just have that workflow wait until it finds a runner. We saw that at the beginning when I <laughs> didn't have a runner set up, um, that it was just waiting for runners to become available. Um, and then the other, there is a way, like you said, to do it within the workflow file as well in order to split that across. And it's just a matter of, um, you know, that same part in the settings under actions and runners to, ha to have more runners listed here. So if we were on our, if we were on the Goliath org, we would see multiple runners across the company right here. But I just have the one that I set up. Right. Okay. Um, and I found at least part of the question that I was referring to before, uh, Byram uh, is asking, uh, and, and maybe that's that's going to be the sort of the, the conclusion uh, and the, the, the final call to action for everyone who watched, but uh, I guess people want to try try this out. Uh, is there uh, ideally, I guess, a, a GitHub action available on the marketplace that would help people uh, get most of the job done to, to try this out with their own Zephyr um, uh, projects and applications, or um, otherwise, I guess there is this GitHub repo that you're just pointing out right now. But I like the idea of potentially having something on the actual GitHub marketplace, right? Yeah, I think that it sounds good. It shouldn't really be anything, um, you know, there's no secret sauce in here. Um, so if we look at like the Hello World, um, I think the one thing uh, that people would have to set up is that hardware map um, on your local machine. But otherwise, um, I guess, you know, also like this is like, where is your, your Zephyr installed? But maybe someone can find a creative way um, around that as well. Um, but otherwise, just setting up a runner and having the, the right um, tags on it is going to make it, it runs. So this should, out of the box, if you have these three things set up, which is the hardware map, the um, locally installed Zephyr SDK, and then the actual tag on your runner, this should run for anyone. Nice. Okay. Well, I, I know that I will myself definitely try, try it out. So uh, that's really cool. Did you have anything else that you wanted to mention? Because um, like we are reaching the end. I couldn't have uh, dreamt for like a better guest for this first session. It was really, really oh, cool. And no, seriously. And the, the audience, uh, thanks everyone as well. Uh, I think LinkedIn uh, takes the sort of the, the edge and in terms of like traffic there and number of questions that came from LinkedIn was pretty much through through the roof. Um, I mean, way more than I ex expected. So that's cool. Um, yeah. How about you walk us through your, uh, your summary quickly, maybe? Yeah. I think the big thing for this is just like scalability. Like you can only manually test for so long and manual, te manual tests are so important. So if you can find a way to properly automate some or all of those manual tests, then your company is ready for scaling. So look at that. Um, the thing that I will caution is that, as like I said, if as you add hardware in, you're going to see new problems that you didn't see before. So just know that they'll be there and look for them, um, and figure out you know ways around them. Like I run, we run that um, recover command with the NRF 52A40 because we have had some problems in flashing it that makes that board kind of like unresponsive without it. So um, just watch out for that stuff um, and get around it. Um, I think. That might be uh, yeah, that go. might be the end of it. Um, I would like to put in a plug for Goliath. So if you are looking for connectivity for your microcontroller level IoT devices, um, we've made it really easy to get data to and from the cloud and control the device. And uh, we have a dev tier where your first 50 devices are free. You can find that at Goliath.io. Awesome. Uh... Yeah, and with that, I think uh, that's a wrap for today. Hopefully there's, yeah, I think um, there's hopefully no questions uh, remaining in the chat, but if there are, if you're watching the recording, basically we will keep the comments open on YouTube. So just uh, uh, put your questions and comments in. Um, I will be paying attention and Mike will, and if it's not, I will make sure that he gets to see the question and uh, helps answer them. And with that, uh, we will be back in two weeks' time. Like I said, hopefully uh, this is going to be, uh, I mean, yeah, for the foreseeable future, we're going to talk um, uh, every two weeks, but maybe more if some of you might uh, want to become um, uh, speakers and present at those Zephyr Tech Talks. Feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, next uh, 
in two weeks, it's going to be uh, all about the new modem subsystem, Bjarki. Uh, one of our super uh, active uh, maintainers just uh, made a huge contribution, uh, which I think actually is very relevant to what you guys do at Goliath as well, but uh, yeah, making it much, much easier to um, integrate um, GSM modems and all sorts of cellular modems or more, actually. So that's what we're going to... Um, dial into next next time mike thanks so much again uh, and that's a wrap for today i had so much fun thanks everyone for being here bye